Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. This is the Centum half year 21 22 uh, investor briefing. We'll be presenting our financial results for the period to 30th September 2021. Uh, in our usual manner, we'll begin with a word of prayer. So let's pray. Um, Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. We want to thank you so much for your mercies which you see in you morning. We thank you, dear God, for the gift of life. Father, we thank you, Lord, for strength. Dear God, we especially this morning want to thank you, Father, for Centum. We thank you, Lord, for this great company. We thank you, Lord, for the 54 years that you have kept this company. We thank you, Lord, for the founders, the shareholders, the directors, the employees, dear God, and everyone who's joining us today. Father, I want to thank you so much for them. As we proceed, we pray that you're going to be with us. Father, we pray that uh, every deliberation is going to be pleasing to you. We pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So thank you. I will, uh, without much further ado, then hand over to our CEO, Dr. James Moria, uh, to begin the presentation. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Fred. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our half-year uh, investor uh, briefing. Uh, I'm joined by uh, Morimi, Fred Morimi, who heads uh, Centum Capital which looks at our growth equity portfolio, and Wabua Kimeu, who is our chief financial officer. I'll be taking you through the performance of the business over the last uh, six months since we met last. Just a recap of our, of our business and uh, what, how we see our business. We, as you're aware, we've largely been grown organically, uh, reinvesting our shareholder uh, capital into new... Just go back. Just go back. Okay, then. Just leave it here. So that, that's our value wheel, uh, investing internally generated funds uh, into, into entities, growing the value of those entities, and ultimately monetizing value either through uh, dividends, interest, repayment of shareholder loans, full or partial exits, and then reinvesting that capital back into, into new opportunities. So as you're all aware, we've not raised capital in, uh, in many years. The last time we raised capital was 20 years ago. And most of what we've done is recycling existing capital and making distributions to our shareholders, of which over the last six years we've made distributions about 4.1 billion shillings. In terms of where we are as at uh, that is September, uh, marketable securities are about 19% of the portfolio. Growth portfolio is 81%. Total assets were 47.3 billion. Uh, market cap, 11.9 billion. NAV, 41.3. Uh, NAV per share, 62.1. Cost to income has come down to 33%. Long term gearing is at uh, 0%. What have been some of our objectives? Uh, one of them has been balance sheet strengthening, deleveraging, and building up liquidity. And I'll explain shortly why that was important. The idea was to reduce the amount of money we were spending on. Uh, interest income, so that then we could fund the dividend from uh, investment income without the need to distribute uh, capital gains uh, sort of to, to, to shareholders, but where you could sort of have a sustainable dividend policy where investment income is sufficient to fund operating costs, finance costs, and still leave some money for dividend distribution and possibly even for reinvestment. To the, in the first six months, we increased the marketable securities from 7.5 to 7.9 billion, uh, growing long-term value. In line with our approach, the objective is, as I've explained, is to grow the value of the companies. And the major driver of underlying value growth is growth in the profitability of the, the companies. And I'm pleased to report that in the first uh, six months, all the portfolio companies recorded improved uh, pro profitability. The third objective is enhancing cash returns to, to shareholders. And that has to happen by enhancing the cash returns from the underlying portfolio companies. Two years ago, we took a view that the market conditions were such that uh, we need to dial down on risk and uh, increase our marketable securities portfolio. At that time, it was about less than 5% of total assets. So the goal was to take it to 20%. We are around 19% at the moment. And, and then to focus on uh, value protection, uh, capital preservation, and enhancement of cash returns. Uh, and, and this year, 
I'm pleased to report that the absolute cash returns from my MSP portfolio increased by 58% year-on-year. And then investment income from the growth portfolio, which is an area that uh, Fred Moremi focuses on. The objective has been to grow that investment income by about, uh, to continue to grow it. And in the first six months, it went up by 18%. Now, that is our total return statement for the first six months of the year. Investment income was up 38% to slightly over a billion from 729 million last year. And this is largely cash return, uh, by and large. Uh, operating expenses were up 10%, so 328 to 298. I think what is significant is that our focus, our objective has been to bring costs to within 30% of income. And in the first six months, we were there at uh, 33%. We have taken further measures to reduce operating expenses. And uh, in the next financial year, we should see a further reduction in that line, uh, a significant reduction in that line. And so we, are, we should be well within the 30% mark. The other line we've been working on reducing is finance costs. And finance costs have come down 24% from same time last year. And so if you look at it in aggregate, uh, total cost, operating expenses and finance costs are roughly uh, 50, about 50% 50 of, of uh, investment income compared to almost 90% last year. And that is significant because the dividend policy, which many of you have asked us about, was pegged on investment income, us being able to distribute investment income at 30% of, of investment income so that we do not need to borrow or to distribute out of capital. But to achieve that, we need to reduce, to enhance one cash investment income, but then also reduce operating expenses and also reduce finance costs, which is the reason why we are focusing on reducing the debt, because the debt then meant we had a high recurrent finance costs, which meant that dividend had to be paid out of, out of exits. So we are pleased that at half year operating profit was about 42% of investment income and it was higher than full year last, last year. Now below that you have impairment of assets. This is an uncash item which is based on a review of the carrying value of the existing assets. Where you've not booked previous revaluation gains, the way you account for it is by passing it as an impairment. And so we have a fairly conservative revaluation policy, and I'll be speaking a bit more about it. And so this year we passed an impairment of 413 million across a range of assets. However, it's important to note that it is non-cash, and therefore it has no impact on the cash profitability, which is the basis upon which dividend is distributed. Uh, that brought the profit or loss, profit after tax to 12 million. And then we had unrealized losses. These are arising out again of revaluation. The, uh, revaluations. Now, when you have unrealized losses, this is where you've had previous realized gains, so which are sort of reversing. So those go through uh, this net comprehensive income. And so the total return for the period was negative 283. However, it's important to note that about uh, 700 million of that is largely on account of either impairment of assets or revaluation, downward revaluation movements, which are all unrealized at the moment. The NAB therefore declined marginally by 0.7%. Total NAB closed at 41.8 billion. That chart shows the NAB movement uh, over the period. The largest increase of it was investment income. Uh, we then had operating expenses, finance costs. We then paid dividends of about 220 million, which were paid in the month of, uh, in the month of October, but which were declared uh, previously, therefore they came out of, uh, of, 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 uh, of, of, of the shareholder of shareholder funds into, into a payable. And then we have the two, two numbers I've spoken about, the impairment of assets, uh, 410 million, and unrealized losses of 300, which is uh, revaluation, revaluation declines. That's a breakdown of the portfolio. So uh, the growth portfolio is at, at 9 billion. We have borrowings of 4 billion against that portfolio. And uh, total liabilities, other liabilities, which are largely provisions, 1.9 billion. 
the marketable securities does not have any liabilities marked against it. And therefore, the NAV component of a marketable securities portfolio is about 11, uh, 12 shillings roughly. And the NAV of our growth portfolio is uh, 50 shillings. This is a slide we keep on sharing, just uh, showing the, the attribution gap. So the share price is at uh, September, that is September 2021, was 70 shillings and 90 cents. The MSP cash plus the growth portfolio, excluding St. Amri and TRDL minus all debt, was at 19 shillings and 60 cents. So trading at a discount even to that segment of the portfolio that excludes the real estate segment. St. Amri, that is 3 shillings, TRDL 9 shillings, total 62 shillings. So that's sort of the gap. The gap currently is about 44 shillings. The, the, on, on the right, you have the assets broken down on a value per share basis. So CDN Bank went up slightly, although the profitability, as you'll see, of the bank increased significantly, the revaluation impact was low, largely because we are carrying it at a conservative price to book multiple of 0 0.6 times and then discounted it further for, for illiquidity because it's, a, it's an illiquid uh, entity. So East Africa, the multiple came down, although profitability went up, so the valuation came down. Uh, long run, profitability went up, but although the profitability went up, the price in the market came down. So uh, we had a slight reduction in the recurring value. And uh, NASA there, we kept the same, uh, multi we kept the same valuation Although comparable multiples went up, we did not uh, revalue NASA there upwards, largely because we want to see a uh, evaluation that is underpinned by improvement in the operating performance of the business. Uh, Akira Jodamo, we kept it at the same level. Greenblade Growers, we continue to carry it at uh, cost, although it is, uh, it is now uh, profitable. And then you have uh, the borrowing. St. Amri is uh, carried at book value and TRD also carried out a book value, and we'll be discussing more about the book valuation of those two, of those two assets. Uh, what, are we, what are we working on? Uh, some of the things we're working on is uh, we're working on monetizing what we think are mature assets, and we'll be speaking down a bit more about that. Obviously, the challenge you have as, a, as an investment company, investing in uh, unlisted securities, is the whole issue of the valuation of those unlisted uh, securities. And the only way you can sort of validate the carrying values is through market transactions. And market transactions are a good indicator of the reasonableness of, of the carrying value. So these monetization events are, are important, but they're also important in terms of getting distribution of cash back into the, into the, into, into, into the organization and the number of initiatives we've been working on in that respect. The second issue we've been working on, of, of course, is paying down debt, and I've explained why that was important, is because we wanted to sustain the dividend based on the recurrent investment income. And with the debt levels we had previously, whereas that debt was very good for us in terms of capital growth, it was eroding the recurrent investment, uh, the recurrent investment income, and made it difficult for us to sustain a, a dividend out of, out of the recurrent in, in income. The third area is enhancing the cash yielding assets pool, and that is the major driver around the increase in the investment uh, investment income. So we've had a considerable increase or deployment of funds into this particular uh, segment, and that's because we felt that in the current market environment, and that was the view we took in 2018, there was probably going to be a higher return made on cash yield than on absolute growth. And so we focus more on enhancing the cash yield inside of the, of the, of, of, of the business. In, in any event, we've always had an asset allocation uh, target of 20% within marketable securities, and we are well with below that. So we are currently at 19%, so we still have room for to, start, to increase marketable securities uh, a bit higher. I want to move on to the portfolio review and just uh, have a discussion on some of the key the performance of some of the key assets within our portfolio. Uh, the growth portfolio in aggregate, uh, the focus was to increase the cash yield and of course to increase the absolute value. And the major value driver is increasing profitability. On the cash yield, uh, half year, 
the the growth portfolio contributed about 532 million. This is investment income that was distributed to Centum Investment as an investment entity, which was a growth from the same time last year. And uh, the focus is to get a lot more of our entities to either make distributions in the form of repayment of shareholder loans, interest, or, uh, or dividend. The second major pillar for this business is value creation. So all portfolio companies are value creation plans. The major driver of value is growth in underlying profitability. And all portfolio companies have registered increased profitability year, year on year. We obviously had investment activity. So this year we made uh, additional investments in uh, in CDN Bank just to, uh, they're conducting a rights issue, 500 million shillings. As of September, we had deployed 180 million shillings. And, um, and also some of our portfolio companies were seeking that party equity capital. And the investment team led by Fred has been working on that uh, on that initiative that should also validate the, the valuations that we are carrying these assets at we've provided a slide this time round that shows where we are on the on all our growth portfolio companies uh, which were the company the first column is a company the second is a sector that is a percentage uh, stake that we hold the fourth is the initial cost of the investment, the investment date. The fifth column is a cash distribution since inception. And then the cash distribution, April to September. And then the net cost of the investment, which is the difference between the original cost and the cash that we have, we have received. And then the carrying value. So just quickly run through it, CDN Bank. Uh, we've, we've invested roughly 4.7 billion actually exactly 4.7 billion we are currently carrying it at 2.7 billion which i think is uh, conservative but uh, that's 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 uh, that's where we are carrying it at 0 0.6 times uh, book book value it has not made a cash distribution yet long on the initial investment cost is 750 we've received 276 million so our net cost is 474 we are, the market is valuing it at 656 so we are at 1.2 times book uh, Isuzu, uh, 978, this is at uh, 209. In that period, we've received 1.1 billion, uh, slightly more. So the carrying value is now zero because uh, the net cost is carry effectively zero because the entire investment has been paid back through dividend distributions. And we are carrying it at 2.4 uh, billion shillings uh, as a multiple of original cost is 3.6 times. NAS, uh, Initial cost was 182, we've received 828. Again, a zero cost, effectively. Uh, Greenblade Growers, we've invested 561. We are carrying at 171. So when you see some of the impairment uh, losses uh, in respect of those assets which we are now carrying below below cost. Uh, ACE, we have invested a billion, we are carrying at 931. Nabo 434, we are carrying at uh, 537. They're also making a cash contribution. Zohari 252, 263, so just roughly at cost. Uh, Tribus 6 million, carrying at 53 million. Uh, Akira, we've uh, had a, an impairment. Uh, we are, we've invested 1.9 billion, we are carrying at 1.1. So this has now uh, went through our P&L. Centum Real Estate, we invested 7.8 billion. Last year, we got, up to last year, we had a distribution of 4.5 billion from Centum Real Estate. This year, uh, six months and additional cash distribution of 269. So our effective net cost of investment is 3 billion. So in fact, we've invested less in Centum Real Estate than an entity that like Cidian Bank, or even our power entities, uh, if you take Akira or Amu combined, we, we, we have a higher net investment. We are carrying it at 22 billion shillings. Uh, Two Rivers Development, we've invested 2.6 billion shillings. So that's just a flavor of sort of, we thought it's useful for you to see uh, how, we, how we look at uh, the performance of the various investments uh, internally. So the focus, our focus is to optimize the cash distribution and to optimize the potential exit value and then to work towards an exit so that then you can realize uh, a value uplift on, on, the, on, the, on the portfolio. That, 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 that is a real uh, value driver. And, and, and also then to find new opportunities where you can deploy capital 
uh, get a return during the holding period, but then also get uh, a reasonable uh, uh, sort of uh, exit value, where you can at least get a net present value of a billion shillings and an IRR of at least 25 percent. So that's 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 a criteria where you can make a sizable return. Now for Centum Real Estate, we were moving from you know the VCs uh, back in 2010 when we started was that one could move from bare land, uh, rezone it, provide infrastructure and build a business, build an entity on top of it, on the back of that, and, and then monetize, get into a monetization phase, where you'd then uh, be able to both get a return from the assets itself, in terms of repayment of the investment that you have uh, deployed in that particular asset, uh, in the form of distribution of cash arising out of either sale of development rights, or sale of infield developments, but then also be able to exit that particular entity as a going concern to other investors. And that's that's what we've been working on. So it's taken about uh, the better part of 10 years sort of working through it. As I've explained, out of a 7.8 billion investment, we have uh, so far received back about 4.8. So we, are, we have a net cash in of, of, of 3 billion. And the idea now is we are sort of now we are in that monetization uh, phase at the moment, and that monetization phase has has sort of several plans. One is get the asset to generate cash that is then distributable up, and that for us is from two main drivers. One is development right sales. So as at September, the cumulative sales that uh, that business had made were 5.4 billion. And those were either completed or in progress. So by completed, we mean we've been paid all the money. St. Amri has received all the money and they have signed the transfer documents. What is in progress means all the, all the funds have not been received and therefore the transfer has not been, been made. Out of the 5.4, St. Amri had received 3.6 billion. And that is from both completed and ongoing sales and 1.8 billion was sitting in receivables, meaning that there's a payment plan and they are getting paid. And, and, and those transactions are what have underpinned the ability to repay up uh, a substantial portion of the shareholder loan that's shareholder loans that have been advanced to that business in the in the past. The second major driver of value is uh, infield development. So when we started this business, the idea was to, to rezone, provide infrastructure, and sell development rights. It then to, to infield developers. It then turned out that the demand was not initially that high, and we needed to catalyze it by being a, a developer ourselves. So we, we, we started doing developments initially on our own properties, subsequently on other properties. And as at September of what was under development, that business had sold 13.9 billion worth of units, which represents about 17, 75% by value of all the units under development currently by St. Amri. So 75% of those they have entered into sales agreements, of which they had collected 5.5 billion, or roughly uh, 40, more than 40% of that figure had been collected uh, over that period, and 8.4 billion is a, is a receivable. Now, those units have a profit potential of 4 billion, but then that profit is only recognized once uh, the unit is complete, and 100% of the payment is made and the transfer documents have been have been signed. So as at the first, as at September, St. Ambria had recognized 260 million of that profit and 3.6 billion is deferred. So this does not sit on the balance sheet of St. Ambria. These deposits are actually reflected as a payable in the accounts of, uh, of, of St. Ambria and the profit is only recognized once the, pay, or the full payment is, is received. So this is a bit more detail on, uh, on where we are. It's a bit of a, a busy slide. But if you can just focus on the table uh, briefly with me, you have a table there that speaks about the development rights monetization. So as at September 2021, what, what had been completed in terms of sale of development rights across the St. Amri portfolio was worth 2.6 billion shillings. The original acquisition cost of those development rights was 265 million shillings. 
So the realized gain was 2.3 billion. Now, the IFRS requires where you are, where a company is holding investment property, you're required to conduct an annual evaluation of that investment property. And if there's a gain or loss, you're required to pass it through the p and However, those gains or losses are unrealized in nature. They're non cash because you still have the asset. They simply mean that there's been either an appreciation or depreciation in value. Now, for purposes of our reporting, because you've previously booked the revaluation movements, the cost basis of calculating profitability, you then need to deduct previously recognized gains on revaluation. So we then deduct the 2.5 billion, which relates to previously uh, recognized gains on revaluation, which means that the net gain or loss booked in the period of sale was a loss of 175 million shillings. And that was an account of a discount that was advanced to some of the bulk uh, purchasers, where the discount was less than the interest cost for St. Amri. And the view was that in the interest of concluding the deal, it made sense to provide a slight discount to carrying value. But as you can see, based on what has been completed, it's more or less in line with carrying value and, and they're fairly sizable transactions. So if you are looking at the P&L of St. Amri, and by extension, the P&L of uh, Centum, what it understates is the realized is a cash profit because when you sell development rights, it then books it against, offsets the selling price against the revalued amount. But in a sense, you are now converting what is a revaluation gain into a cash gain and moving a revaluation, it from revaluation reserve to revenue reserve. So that's where we were. Now, we then have another category of sales which have been signed and where substantial payment has been made, but which have not yet been completed. So you only recognize once you get all the money, once you once a title is paid for in full and you do the transfer. So what is in progress was 2.8 billion. The acquisition cost was 342. The realized cash gain is 2.4 billion shillings. The acquisition cost also includes whatever cost has been incurred in infrastructure and in improving that asset to bring it to the, to the, to, 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 to the value that you are selling it at. Now, on those particular transactions that are in the progress, we've previously recognized revaluation gains of 1.8 billion. So the net gain or loss that will be booked once these are completed is 631 million shillings in our IFRS reporting. So the realized gain is higher than the revaluation uh, gain. So in aggregate of what has been completed and what is in pro what was in progress as at September, we had a cash gain of 4.8 billion. However, because we had had previous revaluations of 4.3, the net gain that you will see in for purposes of IFRS reporting is 456 million. And that is a 10% premium to carrying value. So I hope this also answers the question to those of us, to the analysts who've asked us about the reasonableness of St. Amri's uh, carrying values of development rights. And you can see how the sale prices compare with the revalued amount. So in aggregate, what is currently in progress and what has been completed has been sold at a 10% premium to carrying value. The other question we've received is on the profitability of St. Amri. And the point I wanted to make is that because of previously recognized gains on revaluation, and because the revaluations are fairly current, it is difficult to sell the asset at a significant premium to a very recent valuation. So the, the, the selling prices are approximately, for, for, the, for the large bulk sales, they are approximately they are approximately very close to the large valuations. For the smaller sales, they are significantly higher than the carrying value, two to five times higher than the carrying value. So that is so that sort of answers the question. In terms of the profitability, you then can only recognize a profit out of the revalued amount. But what is important is we are now able we are now converting revaluation gains into actual cash gains and moving the revaluation gains from revaluation reserve to revenue reserves and those revenue reserves are what are distributable by this particular company as dividend.
So that was the issue of development rights. I hope, uh, and I think you can see in the table below what has been completed, the same 5.4, what has been received, and what is receivable. These funds are receivable typically on a monthly basis, and transactions are closed on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. Now, you have another category of value, which is arising out of the infill developments. These are developments that have a two to three year completion period. And our model is to only commence developments once we have sold at least 30% of any development. So as at 30 September of what was under development, the sales by value was 75%. What had been collected was 5.4 billion. And in fact, what was collected in the six months to September was almost as much as what was collected in the whole of 2021. So there's been a significant improvement in collections. What the collections do is that they reduce the interest cost during the construction of the period because they're a source of finance for those particular developments. The profit potential of the units is then building up. So you're moving from, initially it was very low in 2017 or zero, 2018 was about 500 million, 2019 2.8 billion, we're now at 4 billion. But then you only realize that only moves into the revenue reserve once you complete the unit so, and hand over the unit. So although we had completed units and sold units of about, about 520 units, as at the end of September, we, 540 units actually, we only recognized the revenue on or profit on 228 units, which had met the revenue recognition criteria. So if you are thinking about this valuation, and, and this, this, this for us was important, these two activities are important, because one, the sale of development rights helps us to validate the valuation of the development rights. That's, that's, that's one reason it's important. Two, the sale of the development rights enables Centamri to make distributions to its shareholder Centam, which are largely on account of repayment of shareholder loans that have been previously been advanced to, to this business. And because they have been done at a significant multiple to carrying cost, they don't have to sell a significant portion of the development rights to fully repay those loans that have been previously uh, advanced. But then also three, in terms of valuing the business, you are then having three buckets of value. One is the, the discounted value of the sold development rights that have not yet been paid, which are in progress. That is one bucket of value because subsequent to September, more transactions have been signed. Two, you then have the discounted value of the, of the profit potential of the infield projects. And then three, of course, you have the residual development rights that are still in the pipeline, which have been converted. So those are the three elements. And those have been critical in our discussions with prospective uh, potential investors in this business. And we've made some uh, good progress. And we may be in a position to make some positive announcements in the near, in the near future. Two Rivers Development, we've invested 2.6 billion shillings for our 58% stake. In addition to that 58% stake, we have a number of shareholder loans that are due to us from uh, TRDL. The carrying value is 6.45 billion. Uh, our, our carrying value as a multiple of net cost is 2.4. The key focus area for TRDL was capital structure optimization. This was both at TRLC, and, uh, which is a subsidiary of TRDL and TRDL itself, through uh, a, re a reduction of the debt and a substitution of debt for non-interest financing or financing that has uh, participates more on the equity uh, upside. I, I, I'm pleased to report that we are about to complete that process for TRLC. And TRLC may be in a position to make an announcement in the next couple of weeks that they have completed that process. And what that will mean is that TRLC, first, there's been significant operational improvement there, so it's uh, it's operationally profitable. And on the back of that, it's been possible to then reorganize its capital, its capital structure. And therefore, it will be both profitable and cash flow positive, even after debt service. And there are, always, there are active engagements at uh, TRDL level uh, as well. 
So this is a work in progress, and as a result of this, you'll see the improvement in performance of, of TRDL. Student Bank, we've been at it for a while. Uh, this year, we had significant improvement in profitability. Uh, the whole of last year, the profit of CDN was 19 million, 2019, 113 million. The year to September was 369 million. So there's good progress um, and, and good progress across the board uh, on, on, on all metrics, whether it's assets, uh, asset quality. Asset quality for CDN is below the uh, NPLs are below the market average, uh, slightly above 10 percent, whereas the market average is 12 percent. Good growth in customer deposits, good growth in liquidity. Because of the growth, there was need to provide uh, additional capital to the bank, uh, which we are continuing to do to support this bank to, to grow. So we see it as a significant growth driver for the portfolio, and we are quite optimistic about its prospects. Uh, Longon also experienced a good recovery. PBT growth was uh, 103 three percent in the first uh, six months of the year and they have expanded it to new markets uh, most recently Cameroon and, and Ghana they are also making focus on digital channels for delivery Isuzu East Africa also had a good growth 51 percent growth in uh, PBT again it's useful to note that although there's been significant growth in PBT the the carrying values have not been marked up by a similar number so again, we remain quite conservative in terms of our current values. And NASA there that uh, the recovery has been slow. Uh, the PBT though has improved by 76%. We revalued our current value last year from 633 to 212 million. And although multiples for this sector went up, we thought it prudent to keep it at the same value. So we'll review the current value for NASA at the end of the financial year. Uh, this is the school. Uh, the key driver here value is uh, student enrollment, so it's been going up 54% uh, year on year and uh, sort of headed towards a uh, break even. Uh, Greenblade Growers is a small business we began. It's, uh, it's looking quite so. We're in the scale up phase. Uh, uh, EBITDA margins are, GP margins are fairly high, 73%. EBITDA margins are at uh, north of 52% uh, EBITDA, EBITDA margin. And the target is to move a bit to around $4 million. So these are businesses that can fairly, can make a reasonable contribution to value because even if you value it at five times EBITDA, that will be about $20 million. We are currently carrying it at 200 million shillings. So we are currently carrying it at $2 million, $2 million because we're carrying it at cost less, less the historical, historical losses. So I would say it's a business that is picking up and we're in the scale up, uh, scale up phase. Akira Giodamo, as you saw, we've had some uh, a number of markdowns over the over the period uh, to reflect the challenges that have been there with this uh, with this business. Um, expo exploration drilling is still ongoing, and we are still working on a JDA with a strategic partner in this particular field. On marketable securities, we increased the marketable securities uh, portfolio from uh, 7.5 to 7.8 uh, billion. Uh, this was largely to be within the 20% uh, the 20 uh, sort of uh, ratio target that we have, and then also changed the way it was the allocations to more cash generative uh, assets as opposed. So for this, we are not chasing capital growth. We are chasing cash yield, and the cash yield is above the cost of borrowing, which is why we, we are, our borrowing costs about 12% on our 4 billion debt. And on this, we are getting about 15% average now. So it makes sense to draw down on the facility to invest in this particular segment of the assets. And so the cash yield has also increased. Same time last year was 465 million. This year was 707 million shillings. So there's been an increase in that, in that, in that portion. And uh, CSR engagement, this is, uh, our CSR activities are integrated to the various projects that we do. So the Pingo, we are very active, 250 uh, scholarships. These are cumulative scholarships that we award to primary school leavers going into secondary school. Uh, we also have uh, water programs, both here at Two Rivers and at uh, the Pingo. So these are largely driven at the portfolio company levels. And each portfolio company has a CSI program 
tied to the needs of the local community and the key societal risks that are faced in that particular in, in, in the respective areas which are supported by centre. I would like to hand over to the CFO to share their financial performance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, James. So I'll take us uh, through the financial performance of, uh, of the company. And um, as we kick off on the financial performance, so the, the, the company income statement is really um, our total return statement. So James has covered quite a bit of it, looking at, uh, at the return part of, uh, of the business. Um, but here I'll just try and focus on what the key drivers of each of these numbers is. So from a profitability perspective at the company level, uh, you can see our income view. We're about 38% uh, reaching uh, 1 billion shillings. And if you look at our operating expenses, uh, that, that also went up about 10%. Here the key driver really on, uh, on the investment income was the return that we earned from our MSP portfolio, averaging a return of about 15%. And we also had a resumption of dividends, uh, the receipt of dividends from some of our portfolio companies during the during the period. On the operating expenses, the slight increase is uh, mainly driven by getting back to, uh, I'd call it, full activities during this period. Uh, we are back to the office uh, full time. We also have uh, quite a number of activities ongoing in terms of uh, just doing due diligence opportunities that we're looking at. So quite a bit of uh, just a slight increase on, on cost of that. Our finance cost, this came down 24%, driven by our strategic objective to deliver it to the business. Last year, we paid down um, the bond, um, the center listed bond during the period. So that has, has impacted us in terms of just reducing our finance cost. Our target is to bring down this cost basically to zero. And uh, that will be through full repayment of um, our current uh, facility. So then, that brings us to an operating profit of uh, 425 uh, million versus last year about 95 million. I think this is a very important number for us to, to keep tracking of, which is the operating profit, because from the operating profit is where we pay our dividend, our dividend from, because the intention is that you shouldn't pay dividend, that you should pay dividend from uh, the income realized rather than from uh, any of the capital that we have. So by just paying down, um, by making sure that we have an operating profit, then you're generally coming close to the dividend policy, 30%. So if you took 30% of, say, a billion, then 300 million, means that when you look at our operating profit, then we have the capacity to, to meet that. Um, the impairment, this was uh, non-cash, and um, it was basically us becoming, being very conservative again, uh, just looking at our assets, um, our current portfolio, and seeing what it is that um, we are able to realize, and um, then marking down where where we think that we would be able to realize that uh, from that asset. So our profit after, after tax was 12 million, this compared to 95 million um, last year. And realized gains and losses. Um, so this was the revaluation of, of the portfolio uh, where we've been uh, having any markups. As you can see last year, which was the first year when uh, we were, I mean the first um, reporting period through during the COVID pandemic, we actually took about a revaluation uh, losses of about 1.4 billion. This year, the, in as much as the, you see the performance of the businesses has, has improved, multiples in the markets haven't uh, gone up by that much. So actually, we've ended up having to do um, uh, another revaluation um, uh, downwards of about 300 million. So that gives us a total return of about 283 million uh, loss over the period. Um, want to go through our our balance sheet or our statement of financial position. And um, we've broken down our, our balance sheet really into two areas. The, the, the first area is um, the growth portfolio. And when you look at the growth portfolio, it has, uh, this year we are at about 39.4 billion. It has come down uh, slightly from about uh, 40 billion that was, uh, was there around March. And this was more driven by the revaluations uh, as, as we've indicated earlier. Uh, during the period. In terms of our marketable securities portfolio, this has increased by about 5%. As you can see there, there's been quite a bit of rebalancing of the portfolio, and that has also driven the return that you're seeing. Um, there's been a, a rebalance around our government securities. We've increased our, our holdings by about 16%. We've also increased, um, we're also stable on our equities. 
and then our cash has has come down. So that rebalancing is also what is part of driving driving the the, the return that we are we've gotten. In terms of our borrowing, the borrowings have remained stable um, at about four billion. Our liabilities have increased slightly by 24 percent. The increase is really because of the dividend payable that uh, we moved from retained earnings and uh, brought it uh, brought it to the liabilities, which was then subsequently paid in October. I think when you look at our balance sheet, and, and this is something that we, we are constantly emphasizing, is our total shareholder funds is at about 41 billion shillings. And when you look at the balance sheet um, from a shareholder, shareholder funds perspective, about 19 billion of that is actually retained earnings, meaning that these are realized, realized gains that um, have been realized over the, period, over the number of years that we've been there, mainly driven over the last 10 years with the exits that we've done, which have been quite, quite at, um, at a profit. The revaluation results, um, which is about 21 billion, is, is driven by the revaluations of our portfolio. So this is yet to be realized, and when it's realized, then it moves into our retained earnings. So when you look at the, the, the shareholder funds and the strength on our balance sheet, 50% of our shareholder funds is actually, when you look at it, is, is already realized and is uh, in, the, in the retained earnings. Our NAV per share just came down slightly by 1% from about 62.85 to 62 shillings and, um, and 10 cents. From a cash flow perspective, um, the company is still performing well. If you look at our cash flow generated from operating activities, around 776 million from operating activities. That's taking into account the income we've earned and also meeting our, our operating expenses. So here the key drivers were really the investment income that we ran from our MSP portfolio, as well as of the dividends we received and uh, part of the shareholder loan repayments that we've also received from our portfolio companies. Uh, during the period, we invested about 180 million into as a follow-on investment in, uh, in, in CDN Bank. We've also had uh, investments in, 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 our, in the government securities and the corporate bonds, and we've also purchased some uh, quoted and unquoted uh, investments. So during the, we paid about 255 million in uh, interest expense during the period. So we closed with, uh, with, a, with an, uh, a negative cash balance of about 635 million. And that 635 is made up of about 298 in cash and about 933 million in uh, drawn down overdraft. Um, here, I just wanted us to look at uh, the company gearing. And I think this, this is important because it's part of our strategic objectives. And the strategic objective is to drive down the total debt number down to zero. And um, that a lot of progress has been made um, on this number. So if you look at our long-term debt, so we've already paid down our long-term debt. We started off in 2017 at about 13.6 billion, and this has been paid down to zero. When you look at our long-term debt, we hit a high of about 16 billion in 2019. And um, over the period, we've come down to reduce the debt now to about 4 billion. So if you compare this with our, our marketable securities portfolio and our cash and cash equivalents, We've grown our marketable securities portfolio from 2017 all the way to current half year, where we are now at about 7.5 billion, and we have a cash and cash equivalent of 2.298 million. So bringing us to about 7.9, 7.9 billion in uh, marketable securities plus cash. When you look at this, it's when you look at our net debt position. Actually, we've come from a net debt of close to 12 billion which was the high in 2019, to a net debt now of about uh, 3.8 billion, a positive net debt of about 3.8 billion. And, and that is part of what we are, you will con continuously see us growing the marketable securities portfolio. We have a target to reach about 10 billion and um, bring down the debt to, to zero, basically. So when you think about debt at a company level, I think we've done quite well, and that continues to be part of what we're driving towards. Um, now, I'll take us through the consolidated income statement. Um, I think before I start off on this, it's always good to, to highlight that we are an investment company. Our decisions are driven by what we what we, we track consistently, and what we track consistently is the performance of the portfolio companies, and that performance leads us to two things that um, mean a lot to, 
um, to central investments, which is our income statement. So one is the income we are able to get from them, and that income is then converted into cash. So conversion of the income to cash, which is either you get your dividends, and the second part is any repayments that you're getting either through shareholder loans. So the cash side becomes important. The other thing that we track is the valuation that then flows into the central investments balance sheet and also through our income statement through the valuations, which comes from uh, the portfolio. So that revaluation really then becomes important. The underlying driver of that revaluation is the performance of the businesses themselves. So for the consolidated income statement here, we've looked at the performance of the, of, of the portfolio companies, and uh, we are required to prepare this from an IFRS perspective because we own quite a number of these businesses, uh, more than 50%, and therefore we have to consolidate. When you look at generally from, uh, I'll give it a global view, most of the businesses have performed quite well over the period. If you compare last year, September, to this year, September, for example, the trading businesses have moved from a loss of 316 million to a, a profit of 255. If you look at the financial services, they've also moved from a profit of 37 million to 210. And uh, here, the biggest driver is um, the Cidian, the trading businesses, the biggest driver of Longhorn. The real estate businesses, this has halved the, the, their loss from 280 million to 140 million. Uh, the two rivers development uh, segment, this has also improved. You can see the performance has moved from a billion to uh, loss to about 342 million loss. Here again, the funding costs are really what we need to work um, to work on, and here a lot of initiatives are currently underway. The first initiative, as um, the CEO mentioned earlier, we are restructuring the capital structure for Two Rivers Lifestyle Center, so that will have an impact on our finance costs there. Um, and the other one is also looking at the capital structure of Two Rivers Development. Um, on the investment operations, our income has grown. Um, the investment income has grown. Our operating costs have also grown slightly and uh, the finance costs have, um, have have started coming down. So we've actually had an improvement from a, at a consolidated level where the last year we had a loss of about 480 and now we have a gain of about 43 million. So when you look at the consolidated income statement, um, we have a profit uh, before impairment provisions of about 24.8 million compared to uh, a loss of 2 billion last year. So from an operating profit perspective, the consolidated, the performance of the consolidated uh, as, a, as a group then has improved significantly. We had impairment provisions on assets of 721 million, again, uh, driven by our, our being conservative as we are looking at our assets, and um, brings us to a total loss during the period of about 662 million uh, compared to almost 2 billion loss last year. So that really is the is, is the performance of uh, at at at, a, at an after tax position, a loss of 662. We had other comprehensive income of about 418, then bringing us to a total comprehensive uh, loss of about 243 million loss versus 1.7 last year. I think now the other key item to note is the contribution of the real estate business uh, towards the consolidated income statement. And you can see, as compared to last year on the table on the right, last year we didn't have any uh, sales or profit coming from the sale of residential units. This year we have about 144 million coming through. We also have recognized the um, sale of development rights, another 62 million or 63 million that has come in. That's the incremental gain. So you can see from there, the cash gain was about 166 million, but we previously booked about 103 million in. Uh, Revaluations. So the net gain that we had to book now was, uh, was 62, 63 million shillings. The consolidated uh, statement of financial position is just an aggregation of all the balance sheets for the portfolio companies. Um, so really, we uh, put this here more for, for noting purposes. Uh, I'll hand over back to James to take us through the, the outlook. Thank you very much, uh, Wambua. So a number of things that we're doing on the group portfolio that uh, Morimi and his team are busy working on. They're working on a number of transactions at the centenary level that will validate the carrying value of that particular entity uh, as an investment in the central Canada. And, is it okay? Okay, 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I think you can now all see me. So what we are currently working on is um, on, on a number of uh, entities at Santa Maria level. There are a number of transactions we are working on uh, to, to conclude a third party transaction that will help, help us validate the Santa Maria current value on our balance sheet. There's work we are doing around the capital structure optimization for TRDL. Uh, I think we are substantially done with TRLC, which is a subsidiary. TRDL, one of the things uh, Wombua did not mention is that we, although we own 15%, in our financial statements we've consolidated as if we own 100, 100%. So it's important for us that that entity is, uh, is profitable. Uh, we are supporting the management of the various portfolio companies to optimize their businesses and, uh, and, and, and grow uh, their, their profitability. There are a number of exits that we are looking at. And, and Fred can speak later, maybe during Q and A, what they're doing around uh, new new opportunities that meet our investment criteria. For the marketable securities portfolio, we are not looking at taking too much risk. So the idea there is to maintain the average cash return yield around 15%, uh, and the objective is to preserve uh, the value of the portfolio and to optimize the cash yield without taking too much too much risk. From a cost efficiency perspective, we completed the reorganization of the business at the beginning of October, and that will see us save about uh, an additional 150 million shillings in the coming in the coming year, and uh, further reduce or bring us below the cost efficiency ceiling of 30 30 uh, percent. The capital structure we intend to maintain it where it is. I think it's already working. We've seen. Our finance costs are at the lowest level they have been in maybe the last close to eight years. And we only have that debt because we are getting a higher cash yield on the on the on the assets. So you may see us with a debt, but as Amboa said, what we are looking at is a net debt position, which is a differential between our marketable securities and our drawn down debt. And right now we are more or less at uh, at, at zero because the, the, the cash equivalent is greater than the short-term uh, cash debt, and we'll only use that facility if we have opportunities that are earning a higher rate of, uh, of return. The objective re remains to make a distribution to shareholders at 30% of investment income, and that is only possible given what we've now done around cost efficiency and around bringing down our finance costs and, of course, increasing our, our investment income. It's important to point out that dividend is not paid out of the consolidated financial statements. It's paid out of our company financial statements. And what we are targeting to pay the dividend is the investment income. And last year was an exceptional year because many of our companies did not declare any dividend. And that obviously affected investment income and took us uh, uh, you know, below where we would otherwise have wanted to be. So that concludes the presentation. We we'll now like to open to Q and A. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, James and uh, Wangwa, for the presentation. Um, uh, all attendees, you are welcome to keep posting your questions on the question tab, um, which should be on the right hand side of your computer screens. Um, in the meantime, we have received a number of questions, which uh, I'll then allocate to uh, James and Wambua. Um, so I think uh, first two questions to James. Uh, number one is a question around the net loss position. Uh, how did this arise? Uh, whereas you have reported a strong uh, sales in the real estate uh, business. And then the second question is, uh, there was an earlier report of a plan to reduce the proportion of real estate holdings. Uh, how is that going? But I'll give you a break as you as you uh, contemplate on those questions. And to Ambua, um, question one is, uh, there seems to be an increase in the operating costs. Uh, how do you plan to mitigate on those going forward? And then uh, secondly, what caused the loss in investment operations? And uh, what's the outlook of this uh, segment of the business? Um, I think I'll handle it to myself as uh, James and Wambua uh, tackle those two. Uh, first is uh, a question that we've been asked is when do you expect to announce the next big acquisition? Um, on this, uh, Centum Capital Partners is the private equity fund manager. 
a force center. We've been in the market looking for a number of uh, opportunities, suitable opportunities. Of course, uh, during the last year and part of this year, we've still been in the COVID uh, period uh, uh, pandemic. So we have taken a conservative view. Uh, we've looked at a number of uh, opportunities. Uh, currently, we are having discussions with three potential uh, targets. Uh, this discussion will typically take a number of months. Uh, so we anticipate that uh, perhaps in the course of uh, the next financial year, we should be able to make uh, an acquisition. We'll, of course, keep the market uh, updated. Uh, the second question that I'll tackle is uh, how has the current COVID-19 pandemic continued to impact performance of our industry businesses. Um, I think as uh, James mentioned in his presentation, uh, so far we've seen all our portfolio companies uh, have a much stronger performance and improved performance compared to the, the previous year. And that has been across uh, all the uh, companies that we're currently invested in. We've seen uh, increased uh, performance as the lockdown measures have also been lifted. Uh, then we've seen increased activity. And indeed, some of these companies have already even begun resuming uh, paying dividends up to Centum, which is important for us as far as in enhancing cash uh, return. So I think uh, outlook we are expecting to see a uh, positive uh, uh, performance for the balance uh, of the year. So thank you for those questions. I'll hand back to James first and then one more there. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Fred. The first question is why is Centum reporting a net loss despite, despite the reported strong sales in the real estate business? Uh, let me first explain that uh, Centum is not Centamri. Centum is an investment company that owns shares in Centamri. Centamri is one of its portfolio companies. And there's been an improved performance as has been stated in all our portfolio companies. Uh, however, at the company level, we had an impairment provision. And that impairment provision is a one-off non-cash impairment provision where what it simply means that you are recognizing a value lower than cost, and that goes through the PL. And that is what has contributed to the declining profitability at the company level. At the consolidated level, the performance would have been a profit, but the same impairment provision also went through the consolidated financial performance. And we ended up with a loss after the impairment provision. However, if you compare like for like, we, we more or less turned around the loss that we had last year to a profit this year on account of the improved underlying performance of all the businesses. Now, moving on to Centamri, why did Centamri declare a loss despite an improved sales? As I've explained, one, on the sale of development rights, the cash profit is significantly higher than the book profit. The reason the book profit is lower is because then they have to deduct the previously booked revaluation gains. So although that business will be very cash generative, the cash generative uh, ability of the business will not necessarily be reflected in its P and L because the cost base has been increased to take into account the revaluation gain. The second issue is the issue around the recognition point for the sale of units. They only recognize the sale of unit when they collect 100% and actually do the transfer which means you may have units that have, you've collected up to 90%, but they are not recognized as sold. So they have a huge uh, deferred profit, which is currently not sitting on their balance sheet. The third issue there is that they end up carrying all the costs, even though those costs relate to activities where there's significant deferred profitability. All their costs are expensed in the current financial year. So. The, 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 the P and L of St. Amri is not necessarily indicative of its cash generation, sort of what is actually currently generating in cash. And that's why you see the mismatch where they are now then being able to make significant payments up to up to Centum because of the cash that they are generating. What is the progress on the reported plan to reduce the proportion of real estate holding? So I think the question here means what progress have we made in reducing, we announced that we may be seeking a, a minority investor to join us in Santamri where we hold 100%. Indeed, Santamri is probably the only company uh, in our portfolio where we are a significant investment in our portfolio where we are 100% investor. 
So it's not unusual that we would want to to bring in a minority, a significant minority equity investor. I would like to say we've made a good progress and significant progress, and we should be able to make an announcement shortly once we finalize and agree on terms with the prospective uh, investor that we are engaging with. And they have been very encouraged by the sales progress that has been made both on the sale of development rights and the progress made on the on the infield developments of which 75% of all units and are of the sales value of the units under construction have been sold and a significant amount of those sales have been collected in terms of, 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 of deposits and of course the units that have subsequently been completed. So there's good progress there. Um, I would like to stop there. Those are the questions that were addressed to me and hand over to Wambua. Okay. So thank you, James. Um, so I'll start off with the first question, which was um, around what is causing an increase in our operating costs. So at some term level, we had a 10% increase in costs. The main driver here was, um, as I mentioned, we've gotten back to having a number of activities ongoing, um, besides having the staff back at the office. But the main ones are really, we are now, we've been looking at a number of investments, a number of opportunities to look at, and we are having now to spend a bit on that. But then also just to highlight in terms of um, what we expect to happen with operating costs, um, we've, in October this year, which was post our half year, and we carried out a business reorganization where we closed our our shared service um, at the shared service center, basically. And um, we expect the, the the gains coming out of that to start coming in in the next financial year, where we start seeing we expect about 150 million shillings in, in savings just coming from that. So that will come in in the in the next financial year. And a lot of um, a lot of work has gone through the business reorganization just to make sure that we, we see these gains come through. Um, the other question was on the investment operations. I think the investment operations, the key thing to note um, is that the, most of the investment operations are carried out at a centrum company level. We've looked at our income statement, and from the income statement, you've seen our operating profit was about 425 uh, um, million shillings. So here we've taken the investment income, less our finance costs and our operating expenses. So this has been um, this, this this has been profitable, uh, performed much better than last year. I think the only thing now is that uh, we've taken through the non-cash impairment, the non-cash impairment, which then reduced the, the performance of, um, of of the operation of the investment operations. At a consolidated level, the investment operations were also slightly lower. Um, again, mainly driven by the now cash uh, that went through. So thank you. I hope I've answered the questions around uh, investment operations and operating costs. I'll hand back over to Fred. Okay. Uh, thank you, James and uh, Wambua. Uh, some additional questions are coming in uh, online. Um, James, uh, one, are we planning to declare any interim dividends? And what's the overall outlook for uh, dividends in the future? Uh, that's to you. And then uh, to Wambua, uh, two questions that are coming online. Uh, one is for TRDL, as at September 2021, uh, what is the total value of outstanding loans? And uh, when looking at the capital restructuring, are you looking at uh, debt refinancing or new equity? And then the second question is that on the group balance sheet, there was an increase in total loans. Um, where was the new borrowing deployed towards? Okay, thank you. I'll take the question I've been asked on the on the dividend policy. The dividend policy is to pay 30% of the investment income. And we should be on track to do that this coming year, at the end of the financial year. And that's the reason why we've taken all the steps we've taken to reduce both finance costs and operating costs so that at operating costs and finance cost level, we are below 50% of investment income. So if you have another 50% that is not encumbered, which can be then used to pay the dividend income and still have a retained cash without the need to rely on exit proceeds to repay the dividend. So there were a number of steps that needed to be taken and that's why we were quite keen on one, increasing the cash component of the income through the portfolio reallocation to at least 20% to MSP, driving the portfolio companies, all of them to a level where they are now making a distribution of cash to drive that investment income. And you've seen an almost 40% increase in investment income in the first uh, 
six months, but then to reduction of cost at centum level, which is why we've also done this reorganization at uh, CBS. But also CBS was necessary because we wanted to give the companies full operational uh, autonomy, because then you're able to have clear lines of uh, accountability. And then of course, reduction of finance costs. So I think we are at a level where total operating costs and finance costs are going to be less than 50% of total investment income, which gives us enough leeway to comfortably be able to sustain a dividend payout ratio of about 30%. Uh, re re reinvestments will probably come out of exits proceeds. So as you get exits, shareholder loan repayments and the rest, so that's what will cycle back into, into new investment uh, opportunities. Uh, was there another question? On the future. No, that's it. That was it. That was it. So, okay. so thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, so I'll take the question on uh, TRDL. Um, and the question was, uh, what is the level of debt at uh, TRDL to reverse development, and um, what are we looking at in terms of uh, restructuring? So the total debt at uh, TRDL is about nine billion shillings, and uh, what we are trying to, what we are working on right now is that um, not a debt refinance, but really working towards bringing in an equity investor into into TRDL. Um, a lot of progress has been made uh, with regards to that, and um, we do expect to to close that out uh, sometime later. In the, in the next coming months. Um, the other question was that um, across the group, we had a bit of a, an increase in debt. What caused that increase in debt? Um, the main increase in debt across the group, if you compare uh, September with September this year, the main increase is really Santa Marie took, uh, took uh, raised a bond last year, which was uh, there is almost three billion shillings last year, which then is reflected in the, in the, in the current balance sheet. And, um, that, that was not there last, in the previous year, so they took it in uh, around November uh, last year. So that's part of the reflection on that. I think um, other than that, then the, the only other smaller debt, things, um, debt that came in is around the project finance, which was uh, not significant. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, James and Rambo. I think that brings us to the end of this investor briefing. Thank you all for participating. And I'll invite James to make any closing remarks. No. Was there anyone online who wanted to ask a question? No one has raised their hand. Okay. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank all of you for your for your participation. I think as you've seen, uh, there's a lot of progress that has been made at the underlying companies level to improve uh, performance despite a very challenging uh, environment. I think the progress that has been made is encouraging uh, in terms of just core improvement of core operating performance. That is what enables you to where you need to reorganize a capital structure to, to do so. So we are quite encouraged by the progress made. We're also encouraged by the interest by a number of investors on a number of ass assets that will enable us to achieve uh, uh, monetization uh, events. And overall, the strategy is coming together in terms of having a PNL where you're able to sort of, where we've reduced the reliance on, uh, on exits and more on recurrent income. And when these exits do come, then that capital shall be available for redeployment into new, into new opportunities. So all in all, I would say it's an encouraging uh, performance and encouraging uh, progress. And I'd like to thank all of you for your support and all my colleagues for your hard work. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We remain available for any other questions. There'll be a call, I think, this afternoon at 3 p.m. Um, I think a link will be shared. For those of you who have more questions, we'll be available to, to address them. And this presentation will also be posted uh, online for those who wish to download it and uh, make any further analysis. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. That concludes our investor presentation this morning.